afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to take a seat. I'll yes. let you. How's everybody? Nice to see you. Good. Okay. I'm Linda Brown Robinson. I'm the president of the Syracuse Onondaga NAACP. And we have, on behalf of our board of directors, uh, myself, our, uh, our, uh, our uh, officers, uh, we are welcoming you to our 2018 uh, forum. We try to host one a year uh, for our congressional candidates, John Katko and candidate Dana Walter. And let me just get a few thank yous out of the way. Um, I want to thank you, the pastor and his family and his church family, for hosting us this afternoon. Um, we've got a few other housekeeping things. I want to thank uh, Joe Godley, Sherry Dozier Owens, Gwen Mork, uh, my husband Van Robinson, for helping pulling this all together. Um, we want a few things to say. That one of them are that <coughs> November 6th is, is election day. We want you all to show up, show out, cast your vote. Uh, some of us spent a lot of time on the polls. Some of us died. Some of us uh, wait. Uh, uh, far too many things for us not to exercise our right to vote. Uh, so on November what? Six. Six. That's a Tuesday. We are also hosting the NAACP, our headquarters on Harrison Street, is going to have souls to the polls. And we're going to provide rides from all over the, the city uh, to polling places. If you don't know where your polling place is, we ask you to call the Board of Elections and uh, find out what your polling place is. We're going to have roving vans rolling through the streets of city city of Syracuse. And not only that, they're going to, we're going to do one band that's going to be Spanish speaking only. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce my community partner, my friend, uh, who's going to serve as your moderator and keep things orderly this afternoon, my friend, my colleague, Dr. Keith Albert from the Syracuse City of Syracuse, no, Syracuse University School of Social Work. I got it out to you. Okay. All right, Keith Albert, it's, the show is all yours. Oh, wow. That's a lot of, that's a lot of I, I know it's a lot of pressure, but you know what? I know you can handle this. Thank you, Keith. Thank you. Let's give Linda Brown Robinson a round of applause. She is the president of the NAACP chapter here in Syracuse. And, and just uh, a quick note before we get started, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People is a civil rights organization in the United States that was formed in 1909 and is still going strong. I think that deserves a round of applause as well. Excellent, excellent. So I'm pleased to uh, stand before you today to serve as, as your moderator uh, for this very important um, candidates forum. And we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, the ground rules are simply, let's be respectful, let's hear what the candidates have to say. And I've been fortunate enough to review many of the questions that have come through. And I'll ask those questions and we'll actually be able to sit back and hear from Representative Catco as well as, uh, or should I say, Kennedy Balter, a little bit later on. As it was planned, originally, both candidates were to appear together, uh, but at the request of our Representative Catco, uh, we now are moving it to one candidate speaking, and then Representative, or should I say, Representative Catco will start, uh, and then a little bit later on, uh, after he leaves, we'll hear from uh, the candidate who is opposing him, and that is Dana Balter. All right? So we wanted to make sure that you were clear that this was not the original intent of the NAACP Syracuse chapter. The original intent was to have both appear at the same time, but we acquiesced uh, to the wishes of, of uh, Representative John Catco. And so Representative Catco said in his statement that, and you'll hear from him in just a second, that uh, he is always thinking about the well-being of our Syracuse, New York area, and Central New York area. He's focused on growing the economy to create jobs and keeping Americans safe in a dangerous world. He's a graduate of the Syracuse University Law School and, of course, uh, represents the 24th District uh, since uh, 2015. We're so very glad to have Representative John Katko here. And as he approaches the podium, let's give him a warm welcome. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. 
Thank you, Representative Kako. We would like for you to start out with your opening statement, and then we will proceed with questions. Sure. Um, I'm usually here in this church with Reverend Carter and the music going and the, the dancing and everything, and these wonderful services here, but it's uh, good to be here nonetheless. And thank you for uh, and having me here. And uh, um, I just wanted to kind of talk uh, briefly about my experiences in the city of Syracuse. Uh, right down the street from here was my uncle's funeral home, Gator Mass, on, the cor on South Ave on the corner. So uh, I have fond memories of this area, like I said the other day, to, to another group. Uh, but I also have some very sad memories, like fond memories of my uncle's funeral home and all the things that were going on there when I was growing up. But also up the street, the D&D Lounge and the place across the street where I prosecuted many shootings that happened there. And so uh, being in the city, growing up here, and then also being neck deep involved in trying to turn the tide of crime in the city. Uh, I've seen every aspect of the, of the criminal activity, but every aspect of the human activity. And there is a, uh, there's, a, there's a very strong link between the two. There's someone that's here tonight that I prosecuted uh, before, and uh, he made it through. And he made it through the other side, and now he's doing well, and he's got a job, and he's, he's got a career, he's got a family, and it was great to see him. It was great to see him. It made me very happy to see me okay. I never got excited to prosecute people. I was happy to try and get um, get uh, uh, the, the streets cleaned up because the gangs had laid waste in the city of Syracuse when I started the gang task force. But you know, I'm a human being, and I never allow, I never got excited seeing someone going to prison. And I was always trying to be respectful of them. But there's only so much you can do when the violence was at where it was. Prison is definitely not the only answer. Uh, uh, we need a, a full, full approach to the poverty issues and everything else that spawns some of the criminal activity. And I'm happy to talk about all that tonight because I think that we have to. But I have a profound understanding of the depth of, of the poverty in the city as well. I can't tell you many times I've walked up the back steps of, of, of a house to knock on a door to try and find a witness and try and some, find someone who wasn't afraid to be a witness and open the door and see poverty, that would just drop your jaw. And uh, that had a profound effect on me. It had a profound effect on how, how I performed in Congress. And I can't tell you how many times I've been in Mary Nelson's backpack giveaway and just been stunned at the number of people coming just to get the basic necessities for school. And, and uh, then, you know, with clothing now, with Mary and the feeding, and how hard she works and how hard others in this community work to try and make this a better place in trying to attack the issues related to what's going on. But I, I'm encouraged. I'm encouraged by Anthony here today, man. And I'm encouraged by a lot of the kids in the high schools here. And I go to the Institute of Technology and you see these kids that are starting to get some different exposures than they normally do in high school. And they're starting to understand that maybe college isn't for everybody. Uh, maybe this P-TECH program is a good thing. And maybe you can get into other things. And uh, the whole goal of keeping these kids in school instead of having to drop out and become uh, get, get involved in crime and criminal activity. All these things are intertwined, and uh, I'm looking forward to talking about all of them tonight because they have definitely formed what I'm doing in Congress <clears throat> and has definitely formed my priorities in Congress. So I look forward to talking about all that tonight. And with that, I'd rather just start getting peppered with questions and then we'll go from there. How's that sound? And if my voice is a little rough, forgive me. I've been going since early this morning and. Uh, I've been talking a lot, so forgive me about that. Great, no problem. We have uh, water and even more water is available. Thank you very much. <laughs> right, you talked about, uh, Representative Katko, uh, the issues associated with um, poverty in, in, in Syracuse, and you also talked about wanting to continue to look at how we can reduce violence and so on. Tell us more about your thoughts about that, because I guess it would be important for us to hear where you see change and what exactly do you think you would be doing? Well, poverty and the criminal activity, they're related, but there's a lot of things you need to do for both. I firmly believe that if we don't do a better job of intervening with these kids at an earlier age, that um, it sets them on a cycle whereby maybe by 7th, 8th, and 9th grade, they're, they're, they're just getting ready to get out of school and be done with it. So everything from early, early intervention with kids with, uh, with literacy, early intervention with kids with summer feeding programs like at the Southwest Community Center or at the Boys and Girls Club and all those places. I've served lunch at with them. Uh, uh, the, you know, the summer reading programs, all the early interventions that we talk about. 
Um, uh, those are the kinds of things I'm, I, I think are very important. And I can talk about my legislation, but I can talk about that now that we've got prioritizing Congress. Because I've been, a, I've been a champion on the Republican side for the early intervention, plusing up funding for Head Start and having Head Start going in an earlier age. And uh, plusing up funding for summer feeding programs and weekend feeding programs. Because I've seen, uh, by going to uh, the Southwest Community Center, for example, or the Boys and Girls Club, that many of these kids get most of, if not all, their meals from those places. And so if you're not there making sure they're properly funded, that's a problem. So I've done that. I was a big uh, proponent of the CHIP, uh, Child Health Insurance Plan Program re uh, Reauthorization. Uh, you may or may not have seen, I'm a very big proponent of PTAC. Uh, and if you don't know PTAC is, I'll quickly summarize it for you. PTAC is <clears throat> basically a program that started in the Central New York area and it's going on, it's starting to spread all over the country of uh, intervening with kids like eighth or ninth grade and getting them interested in, in different things. Um, they don't target the kid who doesn't need help. They target the kid who maybe, not, maybe doesn't have all the support at home. Or maybe the kid is, you know, his parents haven't gone to college before and they're not prioritizing some of the studying things he has to do. Or maybe he's a, maybe he's a good guy, he's got potential, but maybe he's got problems, uh, and behavioral problems. Or maybe he was just a knucklehead like I was who didn't take school serious. Whatever the issues are, um, you intervene with them at an early age, uh, in eighth and ninth grade, and then you start getting them on a, a path to education. Uh, you have the community colleges come in and work with them. You have the, the employees come in bringing those kids to their work for, for uh, different things and maybe having them do internships. And so that's why I had Ivanka Trump come up. Not because she's Trump, because I don't, that's not the priority. The priority was to highlight this program. And we came up, there's three kids on a panel with us talking about the program. All of them were first generation kids going to college and all were received a substantial amount of education from this PTAC program. And all three of them were taken down to the White House, which was a really good experience for them. And the whole discussion centered around making the PTAC program cool again, making vocational training cool again, and getting these kids uh, interested in different things. And those kids were so impressive. I mean, it's hard to describe how impressive these young kids were. And all being first generation kids going to college was, it was great. Uh, obviously with the feeding issues, I think the working poor, it's critically important that we make sure the working poor um, they still have that support and they don't lose all their benefits as soon as they start getting a paycheck. So the SNAP benefits in New York State go up to uh, somebody that's 200% of the poverty line in income. That's like about 40 some odd thousand dollars. Well, some rocket scientists decided we needed to cut that down to 130 in the farm bill, and I opposed that. And I went under tremendous pressure from my own party. I fought against that, and uh, because if someone's working, of course we want to support them, get it, and getting their feet on the ground, and getting not only if they're working, they're still on, on, on the, you know within uh, within a close to the poverty line or just above it, and trying to make, make ends meet. Why would we take away an incentive for them to work? We should definitely have them getting the food stamps up to the 200% like the, like the program is now in New York State. So I voted against it because of my advocacy. I think the Senate's going to come back with a bill that's going to fix that. And I'm excited about that. I'm a big, big supporter of subsidized housing. Um, my, I have a handicapped brother-in-law uh, with disabilities, and uh, he, has, he takes advantage of that. And I'm always a caretaker, and we watch out for him. So I know that firsthand. We also know that. Uh, in an area like Syracuse, we got to have subsidized housing. We got to have enough funding. We don't have enough as it is, but we need more. And we did plus up some funding for that this year. Uh, you guys have heard an awful lot about the tax reform bill. Okay, an awful lot. Okay. Well, here's a couple of facts for you. Okay. First thing, um, I voted for the tax reform bill. Uh, I don't even think I know a millionaire, but I voted for the tax reform bill for the people in this city because. Um, they're the ones that need opportunity. Gone are the days where we had New Venture Gear and we had uh, General Electric and uh, all those companies that provided good paying jobs and got people up out of poverty by giving them jobs into the marketplace. And um, those jobs are all gone. And most of them have gone overseas because the U.S. businesses could not compete. They have some of the highest taxes for businesses in the world in our country. And then we're telling these businesses to compete. They said, we're going overseas, I'll see you later. So by bringing those tax, 
ta tax cuts down to a manageable amount for businesses, it's going to spur uh, it's going to spur economic growth, which I'm excited about. But it also gave people tax cuts. You've heard that I'm sure you've seen the commercials where they say 83% of the tax cuts gone went to top 1%. Absolutely, positively, 100% not true. Unequivocally not true. It would only be true if in 2027. The, the, the tax cuts sunsetted for individuals. Only then, not now. And we passed a bill out of the House to make those tax cuts permanent past 2027. Right now, the tax cuts go across the entire spectrum. And if you're a working guy or gal trying to support your family, and you have a couple of kids, and you're married, and you're making $50,000, highly unlikely you're paying any more taxes federally. So think about that. That's not a tax cut for the rich. That's a tax cut for the middle class. And I, I talked to accountants again and again, and uh, 90 to 95%, they said, in this district would receive some sort of tax relief. Are you going to get rich off it? No, of course not. But are you going to have a little more tax relief? Yes. And our business is going to be able to compete? Yes. Are you going to be able to stabilize and stay here? Yes. And I can give you examples if you want to hear about them. So I did that too. Now, I voted against repeal of the Affordable Care Act because I truly believe that we need to have health care for all. And I, of course, I'm neck deep in nonprofits. And then I'll digress a minute with that because I was with one the other day, and I don't want to say the name because I don't know if they know who's going to talk about it. But we're all excited and we're looking at plans for what to do when 81 is getting rebuilt. The Pioneer Homes area and have mixed use housing and not segregating people in low income housing and have mixed use housing for people and different incomes so they can live together in communities with dignity and in nice, nicer places. And we're looking at all that too. So, there's an awful lot I've done. There's an awful lot I will continue to do. And um, I'm excited about that. Representative Keck, I want to follow up on a number of sure. points that you made. But why don't we move into some of the other questions? So, because we have a number of questions that have come through that are, are important uh, to <clears throat> this immediate community uh, and with respect to our Syracuse community of color. So, here's one that I'd like to share with you. Since your last election, You've held, uh, you have not, excuse me, held any town halls, nor is your office open to walk in. Um, moreover, you have not been seen in communities of color. As a former district deputy director of a congressional office, it appears you are ducking your constituents in general and people of color in particular. Would you answer that question? Mary, would you like to help me with that? Yes, that's true. <laughs> All right. How, how many times have you been down to your center? Anytime I call, you call right now. And I've been at her backpack giveaways, and I, I respond to her when she needs help, when she needs money, and I'm engaged in the community all the time. I've had eight town halls, on subject matter-based town halls. We open up for questions, everybody. If you recall, uh, I heard that criticism, so I said, I said, did something that no one else in the country has done. I went live TV for an hour, open town hall. They invited everybody. They decided what questions to ask. I had no control over any of that. I have done, this is my ninth community forum where I've come and talked about issues, sometimes with the candidates, uh, my opponents, sometimes not. I've had 30, I'm on my third dozen of telephone town halls, and I routinely take even protesters outside my office and invite them up to my office to sit down and talk to us about the issues as well. So I, I just don't accept it. I haven't been available because I have been available. And my um, intervention with people like Mary, and others in the community are why I did the things I did with the legislation I've done, and why, and like Sharon Nolan's at the community at the Southwest Community Center before she left, and uh, Walt, uh, the older gentleman does a plays there with the kids. What's his name? The, the, the journalist. No, not Walt Dixie. Um, yes, right. Yes. Walt Shepard. So I've been down, down when he does his plays at the community center. Mm -hmm. I, uh, have done twice for tots at the Southwest Community Center. Um, enough a lot. So, yeah, I've been involved. All the more reason why it's good that you can clear this uh, up yeah. while we ask these um, questions and they yeah, come through. Uh, you can answer them and be able to give your direct response. So we appreciate that. No we problem. Appreciate that. Uh, you, you alluded to the whole I-81 piece earlier. So what, uh, what proposal do you prefer uh, in terms of replacing the aging infrastructure uh, of the existing IA1 footprint sure. and why? Sure. The, the, and the, everyone will agree that I think vast majority of people agree that um, it, it, it kind of was a dividing line in the city the way it was built, when it was built the way it was built. 
And we have an opportunity to change that, to finally change the fabric of the city and the fabric of some impoverished areas of the city. So it's not just about rebuilding 81 or uh, changing it to whatever we want to change to. It's about thinking past that into the neighborhoods. But let's talk about the first part first, and that is the, uh, what, what uh, I've done with this. I got on the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee in Congress so I could ensure that there's funding. Hello, Reverend, how are you? Reverend Carter, how are you? Um, uh, so I could ensure that the city, um, so that the funding was there. And we got a long-term highway bill for the first time in a decade but since I've been in Congress. So the money's going to be there. They send the money to the state, and the governor decides what to prioritize for state for federal projects in the state. So um, there's three options, and they're going to be coming out in January. One is a boulevard, and then you make 4181. One is a boulevard with a, um, a, sh a short tunnel underneath to uh, keep 81 going the same general direction, and the third is to rebuild the viaduct. We have no idea what the price tags are. We know that the tunnel will be more than the others, but we also know that uh, it's not just a city of Syracuse project, it's a regional project. So when we get those final three projects, and we can compare apples to apples, um, whatever the community gets behind is what I want to get behind. I don't want to tell people what they should have. I want to hear from them. Hearing a lot about the, about the community grid, I understand why. I, I think at the end to rank the things I'm hearing, um, the viaduct is a, a distant third as far as what people want. And I, I tend to agree with that. But as far as the other two goes, let's see what the costs are and let's see what the impact is regionally. Because if 41 becomes 81, there's going to be that much more traffic on, on uh, county roads in the south towns going over to um, uh, at the western part, like Camillus and Auburn and Skinny House and all those places. So, uh, I want to see what the final price tag is, but make this, make, understand this. The governor can, has the money, because we give the money. If he wants to make it a priority, the price tag is very important, as always, but it's also, um, uh, to me, we got to get it right. And if it costs more to get it right, that's fine. Now, the economic impact for here, Pioneer Homes, the whole area there, is an, is an opportunity to totally revitalize that area for, for the individuals who live there and make it better better homes for them and, and better opportunities. It's also a great opportunity for kids here coming and growing up that are in high school now to get good paying jobs. And I've worked with Otis Jennings and people like that when they're training journeymen to get people to become journeymen and get into the trades and get into unions and anything like that. We gotta do that too. Because especially if there's a if it's the hybrid project with the short tunnel and the uh, the boulevard, here's a huge opportunity to put the kids in this local community to work. And I'm excited about that too. So um, there's a lot there. There is a lot there, and we know how um, important the whole I-81 issue is. And so it sounds like, and I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, so please correct me if I'm wrong, that you will continue to keep an ear to uh, the constituents. There's no question. And make sure that uh, you respond as you <coughs> to the needs and the concerns of the constituents. Of course. Okay. Of course. All right. Another question that has come through Representative Kako, and we thank you, but if you would, allow me to briefly pause and, and, and certainly recognize uh, Pastor Nebraska Carter. Uh, Pastor Carter, would you mind just raising your hand so that we can give you a round of applause? <laughs> uh, First Lady Carter is here as well, and uh, we thank both uh, Pastor Carter and uh, First Lady Carter, and of course all the members Living Water Church. I've uh, read with uh, Reverend Carter many other reverends downstairs here. We've been to church here. We speak on the phone often. And uh, he was very kind enough to contact me when several times to check in on me. I appreciate that. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me that moment of indulgence. And so another question that has come through, um, and this is in reference to the rhetoric uh, that we've been hearing from uh, President Trump. Uh, a number of uh, incidents daily as this question has posed daily racial incidents um, that come about as a result of the language that the president, the current president uses. And it has caused division in this country and people who don't look like him, so to speak, are infected and affected by his rhetoric. What is your stance on this and how do you uh, see yourself in this whole um, explosion of rhetoric? Well, I think it's, it's, it's corrosive, and I think it's a problem. And I've said time and again that uh, I wish he would put away his Twitter account for good. I think we just talk about the things that unite us. And um, uh, he got elected on a very different type of medium. 
he bypassed the media and spoke directly to people. But it's one thing to, to run a campaign, but running a campaign and governing are two very, very different things. And I know that personally, because I don't conduct my office like I do during a campaign. And so I wish to God he would just put down his Twitter account for good and um, just get back to talking about a lot of the good things we accomplished this term. Then the economy is booming. There's unemployment even in Syracuse at 4.2%. We've got a lot of good things going on. And um, uh, it's all being overshadowed because of all this rhetoric. And I think it's, I don't think it's helpful. I think it is dividing the country. And what it has done to some extent is create this atmosphere whereby um, uh, people look at, at uh, somebody and, and decides whether they like them or dislike them based on whether there's an R or a D after their name. And I don't think that's helpful. Right? I am not Donald Trump. I do not conduct myself like Donald Trump. I don't have even have a Twitter account that I use. And I, my Facebook, my staff does. I do not have access to writing anything. Because I don't govern based on emotion. I govern based on what's good for my community. And I think we need more of that. And uh, if, to be honest with you, um, I'm on Homeland Security. And uh, I get briefed on the terrorist threats in this country, which are frighteningly um, <coughs> regular. And when I wake up every day and I reach my phone, I worry about two things. Number one, is there a terrorist attack in this country? And number two is, what the heck did you tweet already this morning? And that's not helpful. Because it's, it's getting away from a lot of the good things that are happening. Syracuse downtown is getting a little more vibrant. The economy is coming back. We have 7 million job openings in this country. Job openings. And that means kids that may not otherwise be qualified for a job, they may great take those kids anyways because they need and they'll train them up. There's a lot of good opportunity out there. And we should be talking about all the exciting things that are happening instead of talking about what the latest tweet was. And what it's developed though on the other side is this blind dislike everybody from the Republican side. That's not that's not helpful either. So I think by just you know, trying me trying to just say who I am, a moderate independent Republican, it sometimes gets lost in the shuffle, and that's a little frustrating for me. You have already addressed this question to some degree, but I want to make sure that I give due diligence. Sure. Uh, this is a, a similar question uh, with respect to the previous one. Do you approve of the bullying tactics of the current president? No. That he is trying to undo everything that President Obama had put in place. Uh, and if you don't agree, then why? Um, and could you speak out more about no. your position? No, listen, some of, it's, some of it can be considered bullying tactics. Some of it is just he disagrees, and that's his prerogative as president. Um, it's it's, it's how, the method of which you go about doing it, right? And there's no greater example than the Affordable Care Act. Um, they wanted to repeal the Affordable Care Act, and I kept my word that I made to my constituents, Democrats and Republicans alike, that I wouldn't vote for a repeal of the Affordable Care Act unless there was a replacement ready to go. And I, and I kept my word. I did that. And so I stood up to him on the farm bill, and I stood up to him when he went to Helsinki, Finland, and was sitting next to Putin and said that uh, uh, the, the intelligence, the unanimous decisions of the intelligence community that Russians interfered in the past election, he didn't believe them. And I stood up to him then, and I made, made a very strong statement. So I routinely stand up to him, but if you want someone who's going to oppose every single positive thing he does, mm -hmm. every single thing he does, that's not me. Okay? Um, you, that's not productive either. You have to try and make whoever is president successful. I did the same thing with President Obama. When I agreed with him, I said it, and I supported him, and when I didn't, I said so. President Obama signed 10 of my bills of the law, and I'm a Republican. And President Trump has signed 10 of my bills of the law. So I don't care who's in the White House, I'm going to call balls and strikes. When I disagree with him, I'll tell you, and when I agree with him, I'll tell you, I'll tell you as well. And we need to get back to that. And we've heard it here from you tonight. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, so do you commit? shifting a little bit, but do you commit to protect Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid from being cut should Republicans maintain control of Congress? This is another question that has come through. 100 percent, and I've already done that. Um, there's been an awful lot of rhetoric in this campaign, uh, and, and if you look at, say, they say words like, now they're talking about it. Well, people talk about taking spaceships to Pluto. That doesn't mean they're going to go. Okay, I have never once cast a vote to cut Medicare or Social Security, ever. And I never will. I'm just not going to do it. Now, has there been some talk about saying, look, at some point, 
Medicare in 2026 is going to go insolvent, and Social Security in 2032 is going to go insolvent. I've been with you some. Are there things we got to do? Yes. But it doesn't mean cutting them for people. Listen, anybody that's in the workforce now, right, um, uh, who's paid into these programs, they're not entitled. Social Security is not an entitlement. It's our money. We paid into it. And for Medicare, it's the same way. We paid into that, okay? So, it's, it's, so it, you know, it's a social contract. We have an who's working. But now, for new kids coming in, like just starting their, their careers, if Social Security and Medicare looks different, is that, is that something I'm willing to talk about with everybody? Without all the partisan rhetoric? Yeah, I'd be happy to. But there's, there's things we can do, I think, um, without having to cut it for the people now. And I think <coughs> moving the goalposts for people who plan their lives around it is ridiculous. I'm not, I'm not you know, crying poverty or anything, but I left a very lucrative job when I was 28 years old and went into government service and I never left. And part of it was looking down the road at Social Security to make sure they'd be there for me and my wife and my kids. And I don't think it'd be fair to me or anybody here who's out there working now. But for people coming in, um, let's take a look and see if we can make it. And they have a whole lifetime plan for it. We can do something different. So I hear you say that hands off in reference to Social Security and Medicare. Mm -hmm. But for folks coming in, you revisit the whole picture? Uh, sure. sure. Make sure I'm clear on that. Here's, here's what I would say is put down the swords, everybody. Drop the rhetoric and sit down across the table like I always did with them when I was working on cases and say, okay, what can we do to make this work? What can we do holistically? Okay, and, and take a look at things, what we, what we can do. If someone's 18 years old and says, okay, this is what it's going to be like for me, I got to plan more another way. I got to, this is my, this is the game field for me. Okay, that's a different thing. So let's look at it holistically and see what we can do. We can come up with it together in a bipartisan manner. Holistically, um, and trying to come up in, in, with a bipartisan approach uh, is easier said than done. But I'm hearing that you are full throttle committed to making that work. Yeah, and I'm telling you why, because I put my money where my mouth is. I had a job I loved, you know. I didn't get excited seeing kids go to jail, but I got excited making sure it's having an impact on crime in the city and um, keeping people safe. And uh, so I love my job. And um, I had no desire to leave it, but I did have a desire to go to Congress and try and show that bipartisanship works. Listen, whether you want to admit it or not, the far right is dug in, and the far left is dug in. And if you're a Democrat, you got to acknowledge that. And I'm a Republican, and I acknowledge it. Okay, and those two, it's 100% or nothing. And that's the problem, okay? And uh, so I went to Congress and said, I'm going to work in a bipartisan manner. I don't even introduce a bill unless there's a Democratic co-sponsor. And so I, I'll come up with a bill, then I'll sit down with the Democrats and say, well, can you be a co-sponsor of this? I've been, I've been Elijah Cummings, and I sat down on the floor of the House and worked out a bill. And many, many others. I mean, we sit there, whoever it is, I don't care. If I think they can co-sponsor it, I'll sit down with them. And the bill ends up looking different after their input. Because I listen to them. It's not like you take this or that, that's it. Right? And so I look back on time. I was informed by President Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill. <clears throat> Tip O'Neill is a hardcore Democrat. A typical Boston liberal, right? Larger than life. <laughs> Literally. He was a big guy. Um, and he uh, ran the House of Representatives. Reagan came in and was like, oh my God, he's this guy, he's this far right conservative wing nut. This is going to be the end of the world. And what did they do together? Social security reform, immigration reform, tax reform, and tax cuts. A Democratic House with a Republican president. Because you know what President Reagan was saying? I'll take what I can get now and I'll keep working on the rest. And that's what you need to do. And that's what you need to get back to. And the far left and the far right are the biggest problem in Congress. And that's why I went. So, they, you hear all these, you know, this rhetoric and nonsense, I vote 90% with Trump. That's actually a very low number on either side of the aisle. And Georgetown University, uh, the Luger Center, which is a very well-respected place, um, analyzed all 100 senators and 435 congressmen and women and found that I was the number seven most bipartisan member in all of those 535. So Syracuse newspapers decided to test that with the New York State and they did an analysis of New York State. <clears throat> And they found, I think they found an agency that of the 26 congressmen and women in New York State right now, I'm number one most likely to be independent. So I put my money where my mouth is, and that's what we have to do, and that's what we have to keep doing this. And that's why 
keep you know pounding this. Oh, he wants ninety percent return. Is trying to drive tension in the fact that I'm one of the most bipartisan members on Capitol Hill, and I get a lot of crap from my own party for doing it, and that's okay. If the far left is really mad at me, and the far right's really mad at me, I know I'm doing good, and that's I'm willing to take the heat from both sides all the time, and I'm fine with that. All right, jumping into the fire, you're going to stay there, right? I'm right. I hear you. I heard all my gray hairs. All right. You talked about Social Security, you talked about Medicare, but you didn't talk about Medicaid. Mm -hmm. Can you give us your stance on Medicaid? Sure, that's one of the big reasons I voted against the Affordable Care Act. Well, Medicaid in New York State is done, they did a very good job of getting people on health insurance. They did two, what's called Medicaid expansion, right? And um, so the Affordable Care Act repeal was going to gut Medicaid expansion. And it wasn't an accident that they targeted blue states where there's no Republican senators and blue states like New York is, is where they got the hit. It would have been a 40 to $50 billion hit to Medicaid in New York State over a five year period. 40 to $50 billion. And I went nuts and I said, no, nope, that's not going to happen. So I voted against it. And uh, I'm glad I did and I'm glad we stopped it from happening because it's actually working. A lot more people have health insurance now in New York State than, than they used to. So um, that's a good thing. I, um, I'm also part of what's called the Problem Solvers Caucus, which I wanted to make sure I mention. That's uh, 24 Democrats and 24 Republicans. And we meet every week and have lunch, and we don't scream at each other, we actually hang out and we're friends. We co-sponsor each other's bills and work together. If you want to join this caucus, you've got to get someone from the other party to join with you, just to keep it balanced. And we came up with a, uh, um, a, a proposal to help the Medicaid that we sent to the Senate that the Senate is considering. So I'm, um, you know, uh, working on that as well. So to me, um, pre preserving Medicaid and making sure that they don't have these drastic cuts to it is part of the issue. And if you have a booming economy, um, less people are going to be on government services because they're going to be working, and that's what we're working towards. Yes. Well, as we continue to think about um, the challenges that our American families face, the challenges that we face right here in Syracuse and in this, in this very community, one question that has come through is, and I'll read it verbatim, I am very concerned about the rising cost of health care for my family. What is your position on this matter, and what steps would you uh, take and act in order to protect families from the constant cost of health care, which would prevent us from getting all the health uh, care and all the health needs that we have in our family met? Sure. Um, I've already done it by, by preserving the Affordable Care Act and we're trying to make it solid going forward. Um, I repealed the individual mandate as part of the tax reform and everyone's like, oh my God, that's going to bankrupt this, this is going to be horrible. Well, Excel's Blue Cross Blue Shield has 70 some odd percent of the market in our district, right? And um, they had a, on the average about a 3% increase in healthcare. So that's not the cataclysmic effect that everyone's talking about. But we do have to do things to structurally fix What's, what are the problems with, with Affordable Care Act? And I think we can do that. And there's several drivers, and some of it's tough. Uh, it's it containing the proposal that I sent to the, uh, uh, we sent part of our Problem Solvers Caucus to the Senate, uh, cost sharing reduction payments, called CSRS, um, to help people pay for insurance. We've got to do more of that, we have a stability fund to help reduce premiums and deductibles. That's what we recommended. And increase flexibility for states to create savings mechanisms. But and on top of that, I firmly believe that we need to uh, we need to have real, true um, uh, prescription drug price reform, which is really important. We need medical malpractice reform, and we need to have more competition for healthcare across state lines, which we're starting to do now in Congress. And um, we need to have these high risk pools. I don't know if you know this, 90% of the people in this no, excuse me, 90% of the cost for healthcare in this country is borne by 10% of the people. That means 90% of people are relatively healthy, and they're paying for that 10% are very unhealthy. But I'm still not so, no, excuse me. Right, just finish real quick. So one of the things we need to do is, if those individuals are put into a, put into a, um, a, a pool, a high-risk pool, and then you fund that pool through some of the economic drivers of the Affordable Care Act, you can bring down the cost of that insurance, and the other 90% can get health insurance on the other market at a much more favorable price. So that's some of the things. And you may have already answered what I was about to ask because you talked about the reform needed on yes. all those various levels, but I'm still not clear specifically what you would do to see those uh, reform areas come to fruition. Uh, right, like I said, we set the problem solvers caucus uh, proposal to the Senate. Right. And then the other things were, were there's, there's bills where we're, we're getting ready to draft up on, on um, uh, 
taking a look at the prescription drug price overall and taking a look at uh, figuring out the medical malpractice liability, which is tough stuff. And then another thing is having competition across state lines. We've already kind of done that. And um, we're working on that issue some more. And having association health plans, which is across state lines, like all the churches can get together and buy a health plan, or all the farmers can get together. If you have a million farmers and you go to a health insurance company, you're going to be able to bargain at a better price down. So um, those types of things. Thank you. Uh, so Representative Kako, you talked earlier about your uh, previous role as a prosecutor and uh, your work toward reducing crime uh, in, in, in the Syracuse area. We also know, though, that uh, the uh, justice system, unfortunately, is disproportionately represented by a certain group of people, and that would be African Americans, primarily African American males. Badly, badly disproportionate. Exactly, exactly. I would uh, ditto that, right? Uh, so when you think about your previous role, and when you think about where you are now, and you, you alluded to earlier that you even saw some form of connection between poverty and, and, and crime, I'm not sure that there was a lot of people who would agree with you, with you on that piece because oftentimes folks are thinking about poverty in terms of low resources as opposed to people being impoverished in, in, in the full sense of the word. Mm -hmm. And so um, making that connection isn't always um, as valid as some people might say or might, some people might think. But I'm, I'm, I'm casting that in a way to help us to think about um, the core issue here. And so if we see our juvenile justice system as well as the justice system in its totality disproportionately uh, represented vis-a-vis -vis African American males in particular, what would you propose uh, as you have uh, matured in, in, in your public service uh, as a way to address that, as also, and also, what do you see as the productive element that we can bring out? Because not all African American males deserve to be where they are. No question. No, it, it's a very difficult issue, but it, it's multi-pronged, so it's going to take a while. I'm not bear with we, you. We're here all night, so go ahead. A lot of the things, a lot of the things I discuss with inter intervening with these kids at an early age. If a kid is in third grade and he's already behind on his reading, his chances of ever catching up are pretty slim, and his chance of dropping out of school is skyrocketing. So all those early intervention things, and I know what I'm talking about because I adopted some foster kids from the city. So I know, and I, I know firsthand uh, what happens when they're not properly cared for at a young age. So um, um, the, the support for them, and the support for them from, from a nurturing standpoint, from a school standpoint, from a community standpoint has to be bigger, okay? And we can talk more about that if you want. But then you got to take a look at if they are committing low-level crimes, do they need to go to prison? No. No. And there's prison reform that we're working on in Congress that for the federal level that mirrors some of the prison reform that's going on in the state levels, right? And that is if you have a low-level criminal that's a, committed a low-level act, um, trying to intervene and help them get straightened out is much better than throwing them in jail and throwing away the key. I mean, Janesville was filled with kids that are 16 and 17 years old, they probably have mental health issues. Then they're putting, they're, 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 they're sh shut in solitary confinement because of behavioral issues. And they don't understand that maybe this kid needs some mental health stuff, right? And then you've got kids that are possessing drugs or drug users going to prison. That's insane. I've never, I, I've, I've never known a, a single person that I've ever worked with that prosecutes something at the federal level for, for using drugs. Now, the drug use, cause you to get involved in criminal conduct? Yeah. But we're also pr we're proposing to have some sort of drug type of court in the federal system for low-level criminals who are getting involved in crime because of a drug habit. Like, you know, but, but if you get involved in serious crimes, like the gangs were here, and shooting people, and the murders, I mean, I had to prosecute cases like when a two-year-old was sitting in the car seat and got a bullet in his head. And I don't care how he blew a high school basketball car, happened to be in a car with his high school buddies, and they, they got, it was a suburb of a drive-by shooting and was killed. Of course you can't prosecute that federally, and they should be hit hard. But, and if people that are selling drugs as a career for them, as a career choice, and they're selling drugs and they know they're killing people like heroin is now, I don't have a lot of sympathy for them. But the lower level criminals helping them out and helping them maybe get into second chance because uh, maybe because of their environment or maybe because of the drugs they're involved in, absolutely, absolutely. So an individual who may have um, committed uh, an offense that is viewed as low level and he is sent to prison, right? Uh, from what I'm hearing you say, that could be uh, a switch, that could be changed in a way that we look at this differently, that we 
can actually think about a better way to uh, work with this individual in a way that he is being uh, helped, supported, and not thrown away in a, in a prison. And understand and sometimes as well. behavioral issues are not behavioral issues because the guy's a knucklehead. Maybe he has mental health issues. And so don't throw him in a jail cell at 16 years old in Gainesville and think everything's going to be fine when he gets out here for 10 months. Well, essentially, when we put them in the jail cell, we're also putting his family in the jail cell as well. No I mean, it, because no it's doubt. a ripple impact. Everyone is impacted, not only the family, but the community as well. But you can't look askance either at what happened just today. Mm -hmm. Two more people are shot in the city today. So you can't look, you can't say, this, you know, you say that every crime is equal and everyone should be treated equal. And that's not what I'm saying at all. Yeah. That's not what if I'm we're lower level criminals, mm -hmm. or people involved in criminal conduct, no question that we need to do more. And in the federal system, there's, a, there's opportunities for drug rehabilitation and reduces your sentence and things like that. But we need to do we have we need to do more of those drivers to incentivize kids when they get to prison and to go to prison to get out quicker based on getting their life together, and getting their act together, and getting out quicker. And I'm all for that too. Is this something that the problem solving caucus could take on? We're taking it on. I've had meetings with uh, uh, the, the administration on many levels. And believe it or not, this administration is very big on prison reform. Very, very big. If the president saw uh, um, As in Hall. the current administration? Yeah. The president As in Hall. President Trump? Trump. The president Tell me more. <laughs> you guys got to keep it over tonight? That's, that's right. That's what I said. Tell, tell me more. We want to hear about this. So Jared, Jared Kushner is Ivanka Trump, Trump's husband. And Jared Kushner's father went to prison, federal prison, for stuff he was involved in. So he's seen firsthand. And there is a very big prison reform initiative going on with this administration. And it's a very high priority for this administration. And uh, I'm, I'm confident we're going to see legislation coming down the pipe soon on that. And I, 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 in the form of the drug courts and some of the things we've been talking about as far as incentivizing um, the states as well to get engaged in true prison reform. Well, I appreciate your bringing that to our yeah. attention, Representative Kennedy. I'm glad you were sitting down I told you that because you're probably shocked to hear that. But it's, <laughs> that's the truth. Well, but, but we also uh, believe in holding you accountable, and you believe in holding yourself accountable. So we appreciate right. you bringing this to our attention. Yeah. All right? And it is on the record. Another question that came through was, why did you vote to have most people's tax cut phased out while keeping the giant tax cut for uh, the wealthy? Well, what, what that meant is, uh, what happened when we did the tax cuts is, <clears throat> there's tax cuts for businesses like described where we did that. I mean, we had tax cuts for individuals as part of that. The Senate has these very arcane rules. And um, to worry all the details, the only way to get through the Senate is to word it the way we did. But we knew full well that we were going to come back and introduce a, a, a tax reform 2.0 to make those individual tax cuts permanent. And we've already done that. Uh, we passed it a lot of the House is sitting in the Senate. It's probably going to get signed out of the Senate uh, between now and Christmas. So they are going to become permanent. And so all the stuff you're hearing about 83% of the tax cuts going to the top 1% is nonsense. That's not the way it is now, but we wouldn't be until 2027, and that's if and only if we don't fix the, the, the glitch. And we're fixing the glitch, and we already sent it out of the house. So, go back and thank you. Sure. Thank you. Um, and Representative Capito, we, we recognize that, uh, again, these questions are, are pointed, but they are pointed for a reason. I'm glad to have all this. Fire away, it's no big deal. We, we, we have passion, right? <laughs> and we want to make sure that that passion hey, is... You know what? When we stop important. having passion in this country, we stop having the country and that's true. You gotta have passion. It just, you gotta, I just, my, my big goal is to sit there and say, look, at, not everything a, a Democrat does is bad, and not everything a, a Republican does is bad. And believe it or not, not even this president, who's done some things that are real head scratchers. But you know, we got it, the, the truth lies somewhere between as often it does. And that's what I'm trying to say. Talk more about job creation for us, because we know we always need a jobs. Sure. I think that this tax reform is going to help. Syracuse always lags behind the rest of the country. Uh, you know, that, the economic highs are never that high, and the economic lows are never that low, because we've been through it all. But the fact of the matter is, we've lost 30,000 manufacturing jobs in the last 20, 30 years. And those are the jobs that kept, get, got kids opportunities to come in. But the problem is, is that the jobs now, in the factories and entry-level jobs, are more technical in nature, and our kids aren't ready for them, right? You go to a factory now, like in the old days, you go out to a new venture here, you could walk off the street, they give you a job and you screw a bolt on a crankcase or you do some manual labor like that and get paid a really good fit salary. Well, now machines are doing all that. And so you've got to know how to just basically make sure these machines are doing their jobs. Do you need a college degree for all that? No. But do you need better technical training to get in high schools? Yeah. And so that's why the PTEC program is a very big thing for me. That's why the technical and vocational training, like 
like we have it at, on IT here in the city, and that uh, this administration, another thing, is very big on vocational training. We've got a lot of money put towards vocational training programs, vocational high schools, because we recognize not everybody is college material. Not everybody wants to go to college, and we've got to start making it cool like going into the trades again. I have, I, I, carpenters, steam fitters, uh, boilers, makers, all those guys, they're all saying the same thing. We are killing, we're dying for jobs. We just need skilled tradesmen. We need people ready to go. So, given the market the way it is now, I think getting, get, get, doing more on the vocational training side and the PTAC and expanding that with, with financial incentives to do so for schools, but also maybe giving some financial incentives to the unions and the people that work, the, the companies that work with unions, to hire people and maybe do the on the job training and give them tax, tax credits. Might be a, something we have to do more of to incentivize them to take that raw product, that lump of clay, and say, you have good character. You don't know much about this, but I'm going to make you. I'm going to make you better, and to get them into those things, get them into the trades. And you know, Otis Jennings has tried it uh, time and again to do make people dream, and other job training uh, programs like that. Those are important, and those are helpful. So that type of stuff is going to be really important coming forward. But making businesses competitive and making businesses <coughs> stronger on in an international front is absolutely where we're at. Like I said, there's seven million open jobs in this country, more than in the, ever in the history of our country. And that it bodes well for kids' opportunities going forward. It definitely does bode well, and you're right. I'm hearing you talk about the PTEC um, initiative as well as uh, incentiv incentivization. All of that's so important for vocational yeah. work. Yeah. But it's also important to make sure that this African American young girl, this African American young boy, sees a pathway to college, sees a pathway to higher education. And I would be remiss uh, for me to sit here and not ask that question. What are we doing also for those young people who may not be able to afford uh, a college education, but still have the desire and have the intellect, if given the chance? I don't believe that every single person in this country doesn't have an opportunity for college. I just don't accept it. And I, I know from my own personal experience, I've had my own way through. My, um, I, I was very informed by Adriana Sullivan, who I became good friends with. I met her 18 years old, came from a gang-infested neighborhood here in the city. She was working at Dunkin' Donuts, and she's going to OCC. She didn't know a lot about uh, uh, how to navigate everything, and, but I took her and I became friends. And I became kind of a mentor to her. And I, I helped her out with OCC, and I got her I connected up with services that she didn't know were there, services such as that helped her buy her books for her, and things like that. And then I helped her and kind of guided her, and she got into Le Moyne. She graduated from Le Moyne, and I had the high honor of handing her her diploma. And she called me and sent me a photo Friday. She was just sworn in as a deputy, uh, deputy sheriff in Atlanta, Georgia. Mm. So that's, that's, that's a good thing, right? Yeah. Now, that's one, OK? Imagine if we all did that. Imagine if we all had one after all. Imagine if we all kind of took these kids under our wing. Can the problem with Southern Caucus do that? Sure. But, that, but people in the city of Syracuse, a lot of people talk about doing good things. It's hard, hard work. I've had a lot of phone calls where they're going, you did what? When she was in college, you, you, why did you do this for? Her? But I also talked her through it. And sometimes, if, uh, you know, looking out for people is a good thing, and getting these kids into college is a good thing. I don't accept that anyone can't go to college. There's there's a ton of help for people if they don't have a lot of money. Some of them means taking out student loans, but there's an awful lot of tuition assistance reductions for lower income kids in this country. And then City of Circus has a Say Yes Education program, which is phenomenal. So. Um, I don't ever want to hear a kid saying, I can't go to college because I can't afford it, because you can't. You just got to be willing to sacrifice. And she's sacrificing, and now she's got a career, and she wants to be a federal agent, and I'm gonna, I think it's just a matter of time she can be a federal agent. So, and thank you for sharing that story. Yeah. That is a powerful story. Uh, from what I'm hearing, then, is that you, you are pro vocation and you're pro higher education. Mm -hmm. okay, because I think it's important for us to make sure that we don't um, lean in one direction as opposed to leaning in both directions. Literally, from the vantage point that our young people can can choose. Well, think about this though. Schools now get rated on um, how uh, how much, what percent of the kids go to college. That's part of their, their their quality rating. That's ridiculous for the city of Syracuse. They should be rated on how many kids get a job or go to college. A lot of kids that get pushed to college in these, in these suburban school districts, a very high percentage of them end up not going to finishing school. 
and I end up chapter and verse of stories of kids going to schools and bouncing around and then finally finding a trade or doing something, and then they're, they're really happy. So I guess the point is, it shouldn't be a judge for schools quality, but it should be a quality thing for schools. Did you prepare these kids for the, for the real world, whether that's college or whether that's a trade or whether that's a job, whatever, right? And, and, and getting kids to graduate, those are the measurables I think. Right? So it includes both college, but it also includes the trades. Yeah, just uh, so many uh, young people don't uh, have uh, that support base from the standpoint of the larger community. Right. They have it from their families, oftentimes they have it even from the church community and so on and so forth, but from the larger society, particularly uh, our children of color, our young people of color, needing to know that college is attainable and that is an option for them. And being able to say, yes, I can not actually uh, go to Syracuse University, live here on Heron Street. Absolutely. And one might say, of course, he or she can go to Syracuse University, but it still may be a, a, a million miles away to them. Right? Sure. Yeah. I remember when I was doing a gang case, and somebody said, yeah, he moved away. And I said, what do you mean he moved away? He moved out of Syracuse, now he moved to the other side of the town. And then that was moving away. So that they, 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 the neighborhoods feel small to them, they're right about that. Exactly. In terms of our veterans, uh, and your stance on uh, helping our veterans continue to feel validated, supported, and uh, knowing that their service made a difference uh, to all of us in our country, could you give us your statement? Yeah, I can't think of something we've done in Congress that's more um, dramatically impacted any particular group than what we've done for veterans. Uh, after years of chronic neglect of the VA system and the VA administration, we've done stuff to reform the administration from stem to stern, but also uh, fix things so that, you know, their health insurance is much better and much brighter, um, that they, uh, the mental health component of their, their struggles often is going to be better reacted upon. Um, uh, PTSD is a huge issue and taking innovative steps with that. So we've done, there's dozens upon dozens upon dozens of bills we've done to help veterans. And I'm a very big proponent of what Career Path for Veterans is doing and I'm a very strong supporter of it all the time. Uh, I interact routinely with Syracuse University and an Institute for Veterans and Military Families, we recognize the importance of alternative uh, methods for helping people with uh, PTSD. And some of it includes medical marijuana, which I support. But uh, they, uh, there's a lot of innovations that are going on and a lot of things happening in the VA system because of the, because of the uh, attention we're giving them. Not going to be one horror story. There's a, a, a now, every hour a veteran kills himself in this country. Every hour. And there was a, we've been mandated that they had a suicide hotline for veterans. People call them up, they're in crisis, they put them on hold. Or they say, please leave a message. And the people are killing themselves. So we've even drilled down to that level and said, what is going on here? We've got to get your act together. So we fix things as, as focused as that and as big as health care. Thank you for sharing, John. And we, we definitely want to always recognize and honor our veterans. Sure. They are dear to us, each and one of us. We think about our own families and veterans in our own families. Uh, I'm, I'm moved by that experience. So as we uh, continue to hear from Representative Katko, we still have just a uh, short amount of time left. I would now like to ask anyone from the audience if there is a question that you have burning that you would like to ask Representative Katko, if you would please come and I'll share the mic with you. Or if it's a comment or any criticism, I can handle it. It's okay. I can go to the okay, great. And, and we know you can handle it, Representative Katko. We, you know, we, we just keep it in order. Oh, that's great. It's not, it's not <laughs> been a good discussion for you all. I hope it's been helpful. It has been. Thank you. We appreciate your, your honesty and your candor. Might there be a question? Or a comment? Sure. We'll come to you. Yes. Thank you. Hi. Um, I'm Lise Baker. You don't have to stand up. I'm not that important. <laughs> yeah, you are. <laughs> um, one of my questions is you talked briefly on uh, prison reform and you said that the administration has a um, some secretive things going on and they're working on it. We may not believe it, which most of us see some of the things we're going through, but my question is this. What actions would you, you personally take as far as rebuilding and prison reform? What are some of the things that you personally, and based on the, the House and Congress and everything, we noticed with your president, the president, 
that he's doing more by putting more judges in, in the, for to rep, help represent what he wants to go on and place. And, and if you look at it, you know, like we say, it's about 69 Republicans or something, and 15 Democrats that were placed there for laws. These are all lawmakers and policy makers. Is that hidden agenda based on the secret that you say is in there? Is it because he's it's trying to secret? Well, he's well, he's he's that for the prison reforms. You know, secret. Secrets as far as putting things out. Is, is it based on his policy making? Because a lot of the stuff so far that we feel or hear, I have to say me is based on him trying to establish new rules and laws that will affect especially men of color because since they've been in there, it's a lot of that stuff is taking place. Yeah, I think so. so yeah, you have, a, you have a healthy dose of skepticism that I understand. Yeah, I, I got it. But nothing secret. You can go home tonight and Google it yourself. Look for uh, you know, uh, prison reform proposals out there. They're all over the map. And uh, there's nothing secret. We've had press conferences about it and talked about it. Basically, what I would like to do, and what I think they're contemplating doing, is recognizing that lower level individuals involved in lower level crimes, that it may have been because it's drug fuel. You can sit down, please. Relax. Um, it's okay. Um, I'll look at you. Uh, lower level crimes that may have been drug fueled, and the person's not a chronic offender. You look at someone like that and say, uh, should it, could, can we look at alternative avenues for these individuals? and maybe uh, have them go through like a drug court type thing like they have here in Syracuse. Have drug court type things in the federal level has been discussed. Having a veterans court, because veterans often have unique issues that others don't because based on what they've observed or experienced while they're in the military. Overall sentencing guidelines and overall sentencing levels for individuals based on their criminal conduct are definitely being uh, thought about. And one of the only things that I think that I've been discussing with them, that I think that we should be bumped up a bit, is this whole heroin thing. Because for heroin, people are selling drugs. It's not like marijuana or cocaine where you're just gonna go out and get high, which I don't condone. But people are selling heroin knowing there's a high probability the person that consumes it's gonna die from it. That is a totally different thing than anything I've seen in my 20 years as a prosecutor. And five people now, by the time we're done talking, Five more people who have died in this country from a heroin overdose. And it's because those guys are peddling poison, they know are killing people. It's an intentional act, so I think we need to look at something like that. But overall, I think drug courts on the federal level, I think veterans courts, and identifying lower level individuals, giving them an opportunity, if it's a lower level crime, to do something in a non-incarcerative setting, and then say, if you complete this program, we can expunge your record, we can expunge your thing, incentivize them to, and stuff in prison, Give an opportunity to turn their life around. It seems that with the heroin epidemic is more important. Well, in our neighborhoods, we have epidemics that are just as important that are not getting attention as the heroin epidemic, um, like spike and water and all those different things. Prosecuted all those cases. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you may have prosecuted them, but they're prevalent, so prevalent in our area. And it seems like you guys only attack the things that affect people um, of. Other colors. So I, I can seem to think that, but I and know. And sentencing and all those unfair things with sentencing, I can basically create a crime, do a crime, and someone else can have that same crime. And because I may be a person of color, that the same two things are with the same elements almost, and I may do 10 years in jail where somebody else may be slapped on the wrist with probation. Well, that's, that's what I'm talking about trying to fix, yeah. right? That's what I'm trying to talk about fixing, right? But, um, How? I just said, lower level individuals that are involved in drug fueled crimes, you know, have a drug court like we did locally here. Give an opportunity to, to maybe get their act together, get their college, get their GED, get a job, stay off of drugs. And if you incentivize them all that stuff on a federal level, maybe they, they, their record gets expunged. And then, and then you have a separate court to deal with veterans, I think, because veterans have very unique issues, a lot of them, like a lot of them are psychological based. Based on, their, based on the horrific experiences when they're on active duty. So that's the of things I'm looking at. Also, lowering the sentences, but um, uh, when I was here, I ran the gang task force for over a decade. I started it, ran it, based on what was happening in our city. And I'm duly formed by the violence. And the people were terrified to go outside. I talked to moms of them. They were, they were afraid for the kids to go outside because of drive-by shootings and they didn't call them. So, I mean, that's what was going on. Mm -hmm. And so we're trying to redress that as best we can. Each one of the 
made me image of the cause of my family. So I don't know I'm sorry. who told you, gave you all the information based on this. I did those cases. You did uh, I prosecuted those cases. It was, a, it was the most heartbreaking case I've ever seen in my life, is going to the autopsy for that two-year-old. I've seen the autopsy. Hello, I'm going to sit down. I'm Chanel Turnquest. Um, I have children who have graduated from college, and I wasn't clear on the Health Care Act in terms of, I'm thinking of young people, you know, they're starting out. My daughter's like, they don't pay like they used to. Um, you know, they have these jobs, and then they need health insurance. So when I think of costs, the you know the practicality, uh, it, it I didn't get clarity on your health care explanation. I'm thinking for them, and then where are these 700 million jobs? You know, because I'm like, my son just got a job as an arborist. He graduated from that's awesome. ESF, but he's in New York City. <laughs> so my daughter's here, she's looking to go to grad school, and she, um, human biologist major, and she was working at a medical, um, nuns medical, mm -hmm. so you probably know the owner or whatever, but, you know, it's kind of like, where are these jobs in, you know, here in sure. Syracuse? I guess it's like a two-part question. Sure, so let, let me ask the second part first, real part, so I don't forget it. And that is, when I mentioned there's 7 million jobs nationwide, I also mentioned that the recovery in Syracuse always lags behind the rest of the nation. Be that as it may, the unemployment rate in Syracuse is still down to 4.2%, which is very low for Syracuse. So th it is getting better here. And when I talk about jobs here, I'm talking about like carpenters, painters, all these people that have uh, the trades. There's an awful lot of openings, and people want those. They want to hire people, so they're looking for people. And they need to be better trained than they are right now. And with this PTAC program, people getting out of high school are you going to be, are you able to go right into the jobs because they have a lot of college credits and only have about a year to go on an associate's degree, for example, for OCC type of thing. So there are jobs, and it's getting better every day. Um, and I said about job openings nationwide, that is true. Seven million open jobs nationwide. Syracuse lags behind, but it's getting it's getting stronger. And the business I talk to. They're investing a ton of money in their businesses. And what's that mean for the long term? They're going to be more competitive and more, um, more likely to hire in the future. There's a company, like in, for example, in Wayne County, part of my district. They bumped along into the same old uh, building for decades and had about 600 employees. They're building a whole new building. They're going to hire 350 more employees in good paying jobs in Wayne County, I think five or seven in Wayne County. So things are happening. And I'm excited to see what's happening. It's, is it, is it a, just a crazy boom? No. But it's definitely moving in the right direction. And don't forget, this tax bill just kicked in in April. You know, it was, it, it, so the tax year. So it's, it's already showing very promising signs. And um, so as far as the health care goes, uh, that's why you voted against repeal. OK? It's, right now, young kids can get, get on the health care exchanges and get a very, very, well, very uh, reasonable health care compared to older adults. And that's, you know, that's still there for them. And employers are increasingly, because of the tight job market, offering better benefits than they normally do. So that's happening as well. And another reason I voted against the, the repeals, I believe that we should cover pre-existing conditions. And uh, up to 26, I mean, uh, pre-existing conditions and having a kid on your policy up to 26 years old. I totally believe in those things. And I think we got to keep those no matter what we do going forward. So, um, you know, my kids are still my policy. They're 19, 20, 23, and they will be probably right up to the 27th birthday. So, all right. So, Ms. Turnquist, were you also asking, how are you doing? Hi, how are you doing? All right, all right. Were you also asking about a pathway for um, people of color in reference to those jobs? I'm just curious. Yeah, because, I mean, you know, a lot of people, you speak about the community, but there are young people here who are progressive and doing stuff, and they're moving away, you know? That's been a problem here for a long, long time in New York State. That's sad. Think about it. When we were kids, I don't think we were um, when I was When I was a kid, there was like 42 or 47 congressional districts. Congressional districts are based on population. You know how many congressional districts are now? 27. And in 2020, we're going to lose one or two more because people keep leaving New York State because we're taxing and regulating people to death in the state. 
on the state level, and they don't seem to get it. And so kids are not having opportunity because of the structural problems in New York State. And the federal tax is a component of it, but New York's got to get their act together too. They really do. You say they're, 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 it's ranked 49th out of 50 cons consistently in attractiveness for businesses nationwide. So we're the, almost dead last. And we're, the, we're losing population on a regular basis because the opportunities aren't here. And that's a real problem. Representative Catfell, I know that our time is winding down, but I, I, again, I want to make sure that I get these last few questions in. He's got two guys to sue for me not to listen to him. Right, right. I'm going to give everyone a chance to speak, but I just want to make sure I get this piece um, in terms of letting you know that you have some follow up questions I, 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 after we hear from my friend. No problem. Yes. If you don't know me, I'm Alfonso Davis. I've been activist in this community for over 30 years, and I've seen the groundwork happen, I've seen the groundwork not happen in this community. And I have a a statement uh, and then a question. In my personal opinion, in my opinion of many people who believe in me and support me, that believe that this president, number 45, is the most divisive racist president that's ever dawned that White House in my lifetime. Um, and just in terms of the things that he says, the things that he does, and for me, anybody who supports that supports his racist, sexist, uh, misogynist, viewpoints, because that's who I think and many other people in the community think he is. That's my statement. Um, my question is two questions. One, um, I believe that the uh, RICO law that was instituted here in the city of Syracuse a while back was unconstitutional. Uh, it wrapped up a lot of young people just based on association. I felt it was unconstitutional then. I feel it's unconstitutional now. Um, and unfortunately, I didn't have the bully pulpit to speak against it. Um, then I just would do community-wise, but I didn't have that platform that I ran for public office and I could hold a press conference and get folks to come out and then really speak against it. So it wrapped up a lot of young people uh, who shouldn't have been wrapped up just based on association. Um, and it was designed strictly for organized crime, and then they applied it here, and they reminded me it was used in Syracuse as a test pilot. And it was successful because, you know, folks in Syracuse don't rally against things that are used against them as, as a test pilot. So that's the one question. Do you, do, you, do you think it's unconstitutional or not? And I know you probably don't because you was one of the prosecutors. The second question is this. 2017, the Attorney General, uh, out of his office, a piece of legislation came down that basically said any black organization or group that that rallied against police brutality or or, or or governmental injustice was is now deemed extremist black organizations and never in the history and I've read a lot of history has there ever been in a black a black extremist group but we had we've had many whites and still got many white extremist groups and they just released a young man about three months ago who was the first person arrested on that. And they had a former FBI agent speaking, and he said, oh, a former FBI agent, white male speaking, said, he said it was specifically designed to almost like the Pro from 1962 to 1971, to go in and disrupt. Uh, any organization, whether it's Black Lives Matter or any organization of, that, that involve people of color so that they can arrest them, deny them their constitutional rights, uh, First and Fifth Amendment rights, and not be challenged on it. And that was passed, or that is actually a law right now that Jeff Sessions and others have sanctioned in this country. Well, your thoughts on that? Okay, you, you, there's an awful lot there. Let me see if I can try and do it as best I can. Number one, as I said before, I'm not Donald Trump. Okay? And I, as a legislator, don't have the luxury of just simply opposing everything someone does because I don't like them as a person. Okay? I have a duty to my constituents and to all of you to try and make this country work and not just have gridlock and stop everything and oppose everything. If you stop everything and oppose everything and are against everything, you're going to have more division than ever. That's what the public did for eight years. Well, this, 
let me, not a lot. I, I, as I told you, I had 10 bills passed by President Obama, and I certainly supported a lot of his stuff, and I told him and I disagreed with him, and I'm doing the same with him. That's the best you can do. You can, you can call balls and strikes. When you agree, you say it. When you don't, you say it. I totally disagree with a lot of his divisive comments, and I've said that time and time again. Time and again. And, but if you're looking for someone who's going to be a flat out opposing everything, um, I think that's what's wrong with the country right now. And I think, you, like I said, the far left and the far right have got a stranglehold on this country and the legislative process, and it has created this, this bitterness. And if guys like me aren't going to stand in the middle and take the heat from both sides, then, then uh, we're, I think we're in trouble. And I think guys like me are the future, and people who want to just oppose everything are sure be in the past. That's number one. Number two, we may have to agree to disagree on the RICO stuff, okay? I, as all I know is we saw more than, more than well over 100 shootings, at least 100 shootings. We solved dozens of murders, including murders of little kids. I, 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 one kid, I still have his picture on my desk. He's at Van Dyne because he was sleeping in his bed over on Wall Street, and somebody came by and lit up the house. I didn't care if the person who shot him was white or black or Hispanic, but he should be held accountable, and he was. So, I, agree with I don't apologize for trying to make the streets safer. I agree with you, but I have four cousins who've been murdered since Rico, during Rico, and they murders happened in Saudi Arabia. Four okay. persons. And so I know is I took a lot of cases where the murders had gone on south, and I solved that because I did all the dirty work and rolled up my sleeves and worked with the community, and I ain't gonna apologize for that, right? And the last thing is what you're saying about Jeff Sessions. That wasn't legislation that came through us. Jeff Sessions can't legislate, so what he probably did, and I think of what you're talking about, he probably uh, listed them as a terrorist organization or an anti-whatever organization. And black so therefore, it's called black extremists. Okay, that's right. That's so that's what they probably did from an administrative standpoint, not a legislative standpoint. We didn't do that. We dealt with some, some attempts to do that. In Homeland Security, we, we, we stopped them from happening. So that was probably done from an administrative standpoint, not a, not a legislative standpoint. And I can, I'll can definitely look into what you're talking about and get back to it, because I'm not sure I've seen it as a real prevalent tool. But if it's something that's being abused, we, of course we'll take a look at it. And I'll definitely get follow up because I'm not here to do it. We'll follow up with you on that. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Professor Davis. We appreciate that. And I also I appreciate your passion. Now. Yes. That's what I do. And, and also your sharing of your personal pain. We share that with you. Thank you. So I've been informed by the president of the local NAACP, uh, Linda Brown Robinson, who is sitting, seated right in front of me, that there are at least three remaining questions, and then I will have you provide a concluding statement. Uh, this question is uh, another one that's important for you to think about in terms of uh, a rating that actually was done by the NAACP. So how do you explain uh, 15% voting approval rating uh, by the national, it's actually the 2017, and in quotation marks, dismal, 15% uh, voting approval rating from the national NAACP. Uh, not for me? Uh, again, this is a question coming through. And, uh, I've never heard of that. Yeah, and I think in terms of your overall um, voting approval rating, and this was a, a, a survey, if I'm not mistaken, by the NAACP, correct? So I've, never, I've never heard of that rating, and I have no idea what that rating right. is, is, uh, is about. Because all I know is... You, you have to... Um... I, I, I don't have a debate here, but okay. you actually made a comment on that when you were approached about that before. But we, we won't discuss it now. But... I'm happy to discuss it now. I, I'm not sure well, what you're talking we, about. We actually have another four and six, and we have to take a break. But I will discuss that with you, because it is. And I'll show you where Fine, I'm happy to take a look at it. Well, I'd like to see what that is and what that's what, what that's done. So we'll definitely get get together and talk about right, that. Right, right. So there can be some clarity on that, and then, then a statement can be issued. So that right. we're all on the same page. Right. Yeah. All right. That, that's so very important. From a national security standpoint, we have to do something to secure a border. Does it need to be a wall across the entire border? Of course not. Of course not. Does it um, uh, uh, does it need to be better secure than it is now? Absolutely. Okay. So, but that's not the end of the story. Okay. I've led a charge in Congress. <coughs> To, do, uh, to have full immigration reform, not just in securing the border, but also dealing with the DACA kids, the kids who brought here through no fault of their own as children, 
and I, wrote a, I, I proposed a bill that gives out all those DACA kids, 1.8 million of them, status in this country immediately, and then, and then put them on a path to citizenship as well. And I also uh, advocated strongly and forcefully to stop the nonsense of child separation at the border, for sure. And I also forcefully advocated that this president have more refugees come into this country. Refugees come in through the process, they're vetted, they come in, um, the numbers are going down. And I spent a lot of time on the north side with the Bhutanese community and some of the other communities talking to them and, and I advocate for them and lead the charge for them for more refugees coming into the city uh, because I believe that we have, we, we, you know, we should help the refugees. But there's a big difference between refugees who do the right way, immigrants like our, uh, that came into the right way versus people that come into the country illegally. And we have to recognize that we, we have to have better security our borders, not just for illegal immigration. There's terrorists trying to get into this country every single day. I get briefed and secure briefings every day about people we're catching at the border that are tied to terrorist activities. And let's not forget it, forget that the dope that's killing our kids is coming across the border. So it's not just about individuals, it's about securing the border to keep the drugs from coming across the border as well. We appreciate your clarity on that and, and, and your statement. We've heard it loud and clear. Should the Civil Rights Act be strengthened or weakened? What is your stance? Strengthened to the extent that it needs out, not all for it. That's Great. it. Great. Plain and simple. Plain and simple. All right. Why should a person of color vote for you? Pardon me? Why should a person of color vote for you? Well, because I, I I, I'm doing what I said I was going to do when I went to Congress. I said I was going to work in an independent and uh, bipartisan fashion. I've done exactly that. I've had more bills passed than anybody in Congress because I'm working in a bipartisan manner across the aisle. And I want to break the gridlock and get things done, like immigration reform and health care reform and the things that are important to this community, like nutrition and, uh, and, and prison reform as well. Those are the types of things that I, I really truly believe in, and those are the types of things that I'm not just talking about, I've done. I've already done them. I've gone to Congress and advocated for you all, and I was deeply affected by my work with the gang task force in seeing what's happened in the city and the lack of opportunity, and that's one of the reasons why I went to Congress as well. So I would be honored to have a role, and uh, we don't have to agree on everything. But you have to you have to um, acknowledge that I'm one of those bipartisan members in Congress right now, and that's a fact, and I'm proud of that. And I, it's because I listen to everybody and I work with everybody, and I would be happy to engage more in the community and do more for the community. And I've done an awful lot, and I'm proud of that. And uh, the people that work with me know what I've done. Tomorrow afternoon, in the middle of a campaign, I'm sitting down with a bunch of former gang members that I prosecuted. Uh, and I'm sitting down with them because we ran into each other and, and uh, there's no animosity on either side. They're just uh, willing to try and do something about the violence in the city. Here. Those are the types of things I'm committed for. And I don't need big press conferences and everything to do it. That's just what I'm doing. And I care deeply about this city. And uh, listen, you may not like the president, okay? And I understand that. But we have to make this country as best as we can as long as he's in office. And that's what we're trying to do. And I remind you, I was a, one of the few Republicans in the entire country who said I was not going to vote for him, and I didn't vote for him. Remember that. I voted for I wrote in Nikki Haley's name, and I told you that. I did that before the election. That takes guts. But now that he's there, just like Obama's there, it's up to us to try to make him as successful as possible for the good of this country. And it may not happen in, in your eyes, but we got to try, because the alternative is worse for everyone. We have heard from Representative Katko. We also have another um, candidate, uh, Dana Balter, who will be coming in uh, shortly after six. So we ask that each and every one of you remain, uh, take a, a break before, and we, there is there are refreshments uh, available for you between now and the time that uh, candidate Balter arrives. But in the meantime, uh, do you have a question, comment? I actually just would like to ask. Okay, and so as we uh, wind down, there's one last question sure. from the audience. And then, sure. if you will, uh, even though it sounds like you might have given your concluding statement, but you may have just one more thing you'd like for us sure. to do. Yes. Um, thank you. Um, I actually have a bunch of questions, but I don't know how my time is going to be able to We don't have a lot of time. I'll ask, I'll ask my most important one first. How many people are on your staff? I'm sorry, would you ask that question again? How many people are on your staff? Uh, 
And are any other people of color? Um, right now, no. Okay. Thank you. Twelve. So thank you for that question. Uh, we, we hear it and we receive it. Uh, Representative Capco, would you give a concluding statement? I just did, I don't want to restate, but I will tell you um, that a, vast, a good chunk of my interns you know, over the last couple of years have been African American. I don't care what the color of their skin is, I care about their competency. And they, they, anybody that's come in, come in as an intern has done a great job and we felt they were poor. It would be good though if people have that work that had authority and had a decision making power and sit on their staff. I agree. I agree. I totally agree. And we hear that as well. And thank you so much for that comment and, and, and question. Thank you. Very much. important. Very important. We want to give Representative Kat Cole a round of applause. Thank you, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Please remain because we have. Uh,